All routers contain a routing table. This table contains a list of every layer 3 network that the router knows about and how to get there. I said router here, but the same is true for layer 3 switches. They also have a routing table. From now on, if I ever say router, you can assume the same is true for a layer 3 switch unless I tell you otherwise. Here we have a simplified example of how this works. There is a router connected to four different networks. Each network is in the routing table, along with information on how to reach the network. All four networks are directly connected to the router. In this case, the routing table lists the interface that connects to these networks. Soon, we'll see that not all networks connect directly to the router. Even so, they still appear in the routing table. The key point here is that the routing table provides signposts. These signposts show the way to these networks, so the router knows where to forward packets. Let's take a look at a real routing table on a Cisco router. From the command line, we issue the command show IP route. There's a bunch of interesting things to see here. At the very top of the page is a list of codes. This helps us to decipher some of the information that we see here. We'll talk more about this in an upcoming lesson. Right below that is the gateway of last resort. This is Cisco's fancy way of saying default gateway. Why does a router need a default gateway? This is so it can find a way to other networks that it doesn't already know about. For example, imagine that you want to manage this router over the internet using SSH. The router needs to send SSH packets back across the internet to your workstation. The router won't know all the details of the path through the internet, but it will have a default gateway, which is like a signpost pointing the way. Right now, we're interested in this main section. Each line represents a route to a network. For example, we see the networks that are directly connected to the router. You'll also notice that these use CIDR notation. Notice that our directly connected routes are organized as part of the 10.0.0.0.8 network. This is something that Cisco and some other vendors do. Think of these as large networks that the router has divided into smaller networks. 10.0.0.0.8 is the main network, and the networks listed beneath are subnetworks, or subnets. These are the actual routes we're interested in. To be honest, I never look at the summary headings. I'm only ever interested in the subnet routes. Most of our routes have either an L or a C next to them. These mean local and connected. A local route is an IP address that's configured on the router. Notice that these have a slash 32 subnet mask as it's referring to a specific IP address. The highlighted example shows 10.0.0.1 as the local route. This is the IP that belongs to interface gig 0 slash 0. A connected route is a network that our router is directly connected to. As you can see, each connected route will pair with a local route. Connected routes also list the interface that connects to the network. Some of our routes are not connected to this router. Look at 10.250.0.0/16 for example. The S code over on the left means it's a static route. Also, it doesn't have an interface listed. Instead, it has via 10.0.0.2. This means that to reach the 10.250.0.0/16 network, traffic passes to another router first. The other router's IP is 10.0.0.2. We call this the next hop as it's the next device along the path. We've got another special looking route here. This one is all zeros with a subnet mask of slash zero. It looks like a static route, but it also has a star symbol next to it. So what's this guy all about? This is the default route for the routing table. This is for when the router needs to forward packets, but doesn't have a route for the destination network. A good example of this is for routing traffic to the internet. We can't expect our router to know every single possible network on the internet, now can we? So we have a default route, acting like a signpost pointing toward the internet. While internet access is the main reason to have default routes, there are some others too, and we'll take a look at some of those in the next lesson. Why don't we try adding a new route now? 
We're adding this route manually, so it's called a static route. We'll look at dynamic routes in a later lesson. Let's break down what this command did. The IP route command creates the static route. 172.16.0.0 is the destination network that we want to reach. 255.255.0.0 is the subnet mask of the destination network. Notice it's in dotted decimal notation. 10.0.2200 is the next hop IP. This is the IP address of the next router in the path. It's pretty easy, right? I guarantee that you will configure many static routes in your lifetime. Looking at the routing table once again, we can see the new route. But isn't this interesting? We have two routes which are almost the same. There is 172.16.0.0/24 and 172.16.0.0/16. The only difference is the length of the subnet mask. Now, is that even valid? Yes, it is. See, these aren't actually the same network. They are two different networks, yet they do overlap. When you think about it, the slash 24 network is actually a small part of the slash 16 network. You'll also see the next hop IP addresses for these networks are different. Now this raises an interesting question. If our router wanted to forward a packet to say 172.16.0.22, which next hop would it use? This brings us to the next key point. The longest match always wins. The term for this is longest prefix match or LPM. To understand this, let's start with the term prefix. The prefix is another term for the network part under the IP address. As we discussed earlier, the subnet mask determines which part of the IP is the network part. So the length of the subnet mask determines the length of the prefix. In our examples, we have a 24-bit prefix and a 16-bit prefix. Which one's longer? Well, a 24-bit prefix, of course. So if a router wanted to forward a packet to 172.16.0.22, it would use this route. That means it would have the next hop IP of 10.0.10.2. Make sure you always remember this concept. Longest prefix match always wins. You'll find that particularly useful in these quiz questions. I recommend practicing what you've learned to build your skills. To help with that, I've created this lab with three challenges for you to try. In the first challenge, you need to configure a layer 3 switch. This needs to pass traffic between VLANs 20 and 30. In challenge 2, you convert the switch back to layer 2 and add a router. The router now handles passing traffic between the VLANs. And in challenge three, there's a fault in the network. You need to track it down and fix it. All challenges come with explanations if you get stuck. Please continue to the next video where we'll look at designing subnets. This takes a real world approach that you might find useful at your job. Hope to see you there.